Hello, and thanks for tuning into this live stream. My name is Grant Ammon, and I'm the director of Goethe Pop of Houston. We are a temporary branch of the Goethe Institute, the Cultural Institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We present a contemporary German art and culture in Houston and help shape a current understanding of Germany today. Good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Barnes Wilson, and I'm the curator and art director of Project Row Houses in Third Ward, Houston, Texas. Project Row Houses is a community platform that enriches lives through art with an emphasis on cultural identity and its impact on the urban landscape. Our mission is to empower people in rich communities through engagement, art, and direct action. We're delighted to host this conversation this evening at Project Row Houses around Round 52, Gulf Coast Anthropocene. This year marks what would have been the 100th birthday of German artist Joseph Beuys. Widely regarded as one of the most influential artists of his time, Beuys pushed the definition of art to its limits through his ritualistic performances and use of non-traditional materials. For Beuys, art was not just an object to be admired and collected, but a vehicle for positive social, political, and environmental change. Together with Project Warehouses, we have brought together three experts who will discuss the legacy of Joseph Beuys in Houston and beyond. Today, we are joined by Allison Weaver, the Executive Director of the Moody Center for the Arts at Rice University, Houston's own distinguished artist and Project Warehouses co-founder, Rick Lowe, and our moderator, Linda Shearer, whose extensive resume includes the Guggenheim, New York Museum of Modern Art, the Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston, Houston Center for Photography, and Project Warehouses. A big thanks to everyone for joining us this evening, and I'll now hand it over to them. <coughs> All right. Well, it's great to be here with, with uh, Rick and Allison. I'm Linda Shearer. I used to be the director of Project Row Houses, um, which was a great experience. And um, I am now an art appraiser in my retirement. Uh, the reason I'm on this panel is because um, I was the assistant curator at the Guggenheim Museum when Joseph Boyce's major American exhibition was, was uh, in, held. And this is the catalog. Uh, which is kind of amazing if you have a chance to see it. Uh, and I'm here with Rick Lowe, who is one of the seven founders of Project Row Houses, and who was drawn to uh, the, these incredible houses uh, with a vision that combined the painter John Biggers with Joseph Boyce's concept of social sculpture. And that's been the, the focus for all these, how many years now? Nearly 30. <laughs> Nearly 30, oh my God. And Allison Weaver is the founding director of the um, Moody Center for the Arts at Rice University. And you've been here how many years now? Six years. I can't believe it. Oh my Not God. quite 30. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but six years. And the Moody Center does wonderful, wonderful work. And her connection to Boyce is that her dissertation is based on the, re, the responses and reactions of artists to this 1979 exhibition. Um, so that's why the three of us are here together. Um, I, I was, the, the, as I say, the assistant curator at the Guggenheim at the time of the exhibition. And, um, and got to know Boyce. Um, he was a, a commanding figure. And did you ever meet him? No, nope, yeah. never did. No, he, he was, um, um, I'll just start off with just a few uh, stories, I guess. Um, he, well, in terms of this exhibition, uh, it was the first time the, muse the Guggenheim Museum had ever devoted the entire museum to a contemporary artist. Mm -hmm. And it w was mind-boggling in the sense that it was from top to bottom. And, and people were, different museums, and especially the modern, were vying at that time in the 70s to show him his work. And he had made a point of not showing in America until we were out of Vietnam. And that 
somehow the director at the time, Thomas Messer, was able to convince Boyce that this was the thing for him to do, and he and he did it, um, which was a real coup for the Guggenheim because everybody wanted Boyce to be uh, showing with them, and so I had the the distinct uh, and unique experience of being the the curatorial coordinator, and the curator was a woman named Carolyn Tisdale, who was based who's English and based in. Um, uh, England, and it was. I guess we had. I guess we had email then. We had email. <laughs> the late seventies. I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We, we, I mean, it, it was either the phone. It was mostly the phone, I think, and and memos. Uh, and it was really. And he was in Germany. We were in New York, and Carolyn was in in England, and it was. It was unbelievable to coordinate and get everything under control, and the um, the work was um, the, to install the work was extraordinarily uh, labor intensive and with all these strange materials for the most part. But it all it all worked out, and it was a great experience, and and really um, affected me very profoundly uh, in terms of what art could be, and. The, the um, two anecdotes I'll tell you is, one, um, if you do get to see this catalog with all the photographs that are in it are by someone in the house, and I believe, I'm quite certain that they had had an affair. <laughs> uh, and um, she tried to stop the publication of this catalog because we hadn't, the Guggenheim hadn't gotten permission from her. And practically all of these photographs are, are hers. And she then came to New York during the installation, representing one of the main, she was a, a, a media person for one of the main German newspapers. And when she arrived on the scene, Joseph looked at me, no, no, Joseph looked at his right-hand man and basically said, you tell Linda that this woman has to get out of here or I am stopping everything. And I told, I told you this, Grant, I know. Uh, and um, I don't know how I did it, but I somehow convinced her, I don't know how, to just not be on the premises. So he continued. Um, and uh, it was, it was, um, there was lots of drama. Um, so, what was the, well, I've, I've actually just forgotten what the other <laughs> story was, which I'll remember at a certain point. Um, so, Rick, let's start with you in terms of just how, how did you first learn about voice and how did you feel, how did he impact you? Well, I, uh, I'm very interested to hear uh, Allison's her, the responses that, that were happening to that exhibition because I haven't read that, so I'm very curious to hear about that. But for me, um, uh, I, I guess I knew about uh, boys in the 80s. Uh, there was an artist that I was working with at the time who we were painting houses, and he was fascinated with just boys. Uh, he was fascinated by you know, the use of materials and uh, you know, organic materials that he would use and that kind of stuff. He was, so, yeah, this uh, uh, actually an artist named Virgil Brokefeld, you know, he was very fascinated with this material and stuff, but he also knew a bit more about the boys and his politics and, and, uh, and all of his interests outside of, you know, that went behind the use of the material. I didn't know that. I just yeah. was looking at it from a formal standpoint, and I just wasn't interested in yeah. it at all through the '80s. And um, and it wasn't until the '90s, early '90s, mm -hmm. that I shut down my studio uh, painting. I just stopped, and I wanted to. I just wanted to do some research and try to figure out, you know. Are there artists out there that are doing things that 
go beyond the kind of stuff that I was doing, which was mostly doing these installations, painting, and painted installations that were dealing with all kinds of political issues and stuff. And I was organizing political rallies around these installations and that kind of stuff. So I was, in my own way, I was trying to push the boundaries of how the art is connecting with people. But I wanted to see if there was something else. And so doing that probably about a year without doing anything in the studio, I was just reading. And I went back and uh, picked up this book that Virgil had given me some time ago, Energy Plan for Western Man, mm -hmm. Joseph Boys, and I was like, oh, what's this? You know, so I kind of flipped through it, and for the first time I noticed that uh, chapter two that was social sculpture. And that's, I was like, hmm, what's that? <laughs> and I read that. Uh, uh, I read that chapter, and I would have to say it was the first maybe five pages of that chapter that really like, I mean, turned everything around for me. Wow. Yeah. That was the, you know, I thought this, this concept and this idea of social sculpture was something that could be very valuable and meaningful for the kind of stuff that I was interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I know at some event when I was here, I think it was an anniversary, um, it was clear to me that um, Project Row Houses, picking up on exactly what you're saying in terms of social sculpture, were, you were doing, and your, your compatriots were doing what is now we know as social practice, but there was no word for it. Right. There was no terminology unless you knew, unless you knew the voice situation. Right. right. Um, yeah, I find it fascinating too that even now, I mean, oh, there, there's a, a, a reticence to use social sculpture. I mean, people yeah. don't particularly use it. I mean, that, I mean, that's why we have social practice. Right. right. I mean, it's a response to people not feeling comfortable using yeah. that terminology, which is, which is interesting because it was a terminology that really opened things up for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So tell us about your... Well, I, I think what I want to just echo what, what Rick is saying in that, that I, I do think that there was a progression of the reception of Joseph Boyce. So if you think about how artists, what artists took from his practice, it really started with the formal aspects. So starting in the 1960s, you had artists like Bob Morris, um, Richard Serra, Eva Hesse, um, uh, going to Dusseldorf and experiencing his work, because you had to go there, it wasn't the internet, mm -hmm. um, and then coming back and working in uh, molten lead and felt, yeah. and um, these materials that were incredibly profound. Uh, Bruce Nauman writes about, you know, he made the cast under his chair after visiting Boise's studio mm -hmm. and saying a fat chair, or from the early 60s. So you had this early reception being more material in, in nature and formal, if you will, and then I think it progressed on to the more performative. Um, so you had how to explain pictures to, the, to a dead hair, one of Boise's seminal performance works, 64, 65. 65 yeah. um, and then even go through the early 70s, I think um, I Like America and America Likes Me, which is the, the coyote piece at the Renee Black Gallery in the 74. And you have artists going to see that every day. And, and, um, and I, I think, uh, that his ability to create these memorable tableau that were so powerful from a performative point of view, um, that it really wasn't until almost a third wave mm -hmm. that people started to look at um, what he did to create um, engagement with, with the community and with pedagogy and to really go beyond the, the performance and sculpture work to engage with the community. So I think about you know, he founded the Free International University, mm -hmm. late 70s, which became influential for groups, much later groups like Bruce High Quality Foundation. And you had um, people really looking at his, also his environmental works, um, critical work of 7,000 Oaks, which is a later. Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, maybe 81, cut for a documentary in 1981. Mm -hmm. um, and so people, I think, were late to come to that idea of his that you could um, and I think I think maybe we should for our audience to find social sculpture um, and, and social this idea of, of his that really 
anything living can be art, right? That in our lives, in our conversation, in our actions, anything from sweeping before, I think of, of some of his actions being, um, or teaching um, being so important to his practice. So this idea that the expanded concept didn't, I don't think filtered into, at least not from the American side, until kind of that later, which is right, right when you were like right on time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, and so the, I, the, the idea that anyone can be an artist is something that is at the very core of Project Rojas, um, that is, that, that understands that everybody, whether they're trained or not trained, has a, has a creative, you know, not strength, but ability, and it's, it's giving that respect and that due to, uh, that I think is something that came very definitely um, from from voice that that uh, has I mean I mean you've you've transplanted the concept to different venues in different places um, but this is probably where it's really taken the most hold. Yeah, yeah, this is a place that I've really you know I I've, I've really put everything into this place and it was all driven by this idea of making social sculpture, you know, and that was, you know, it was the sole focus at that time. But I wonder though, you know, Allison, about the, um, uh, you know, the, the formal attention to his work, it, you know, I mean, I always think of the, you know, the 70s as being, you know, a decade of formalism, I mean, strong formalism, you know, and and you know the identity stuff and all that stuff sort of coming in the eighties sort of pushed things open. Mm -hmm. And do you think that was? I mean, yeah, you know, in terms of why, you know, why was it the nineties that you know it finally kind of opened up? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think certainly the seventies, the legacy of Greenberg and formalism, and what's always interesting, I think, at least in the, the American reception of boys, is that. There's a consistent trend of divorcing what is what is taken from the symbolic. So, you know, in those performances, Boy is presenting himself in a shamanistic fashion, mm -hmm. very much um, using materials that for him were imbued with symbolic meaning, you know, riffing off of Rudolf Steiner and others with the, the honey and the felt and all of these things. But for I think for American artists and audiences that the symbolic piece was not as generative, if you will, so it was therefore kind of left left behind. And I think that um, it was potentially, I think, in the legacy of the Reagan years, you know, if you think about the 80s and in the United States facing what was coming out of um, the, the political and economic um, culture of that, I think, then manifested. It, it, it started to be how could art address these important critical issues, whether it's the environment, whether it's um, political and socioeconomic divides, um, which of course now we have yeah. in, in even greater spades, but felt very important certainly in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, so I think that's when just as you, you described seeking a means of addressing critical issues um, through the arts and how could we how could that become important? And I think, boys, you know, I, I, I'll quote um, another great Houston artist, Mel Chen, who, who spoke at a, there was a conference in the late 80s, I think 87, about the legacy of boys. And Mel spoke that um, he didn't talk direct about being directly influenced by boys, but said that boys created osmotically the conditions for his artwork to exist. Mm -hmm. That it was a sort of opening up that this very multivalent practice, I mean, voice is a complicated figure yeah. and certainly worked across media in ways that, you know, were problematic at times even. Um, but this idea that there could be an opening up of engagement um, through these various practices from, from pedagogy to action to community engagement, I think that's what um, really was so generative for, for artists here, and it just took time to catch on. So I, I would say it was a combination of the political environment here and the need to really go towards, away from the formalism of the, the post-war modernist period and toward 
How can we make the world a better place? And I, there's a certain amount of optimism in voice. I mean, he really believed that through his work, we could make the world a better place. And that's an unpopular thing in critical and art historical yeah, circles, yeah. right? We like to be, we like to be very analytic and cynical. And you have people like been doing book mm -hmm. critiquing this yeah, show yeah, yeah. in a very harsh way. But I think that idea of voice enabled that that we could experiment with these forms in order to have those important conversations that ultimately impact change. And, and, um, and you know, I think that's, I hope, what's still with us, right? And he certainly opened up in, um, I mean, there was, at the time of the exhibition, there was a panel discussion um, that was at the, at the Guggenheim that was included, you know, a, a sociologist, an environmental person, uh, a philosopher uh, and voice, and and he opened up all of the, um, the the sense of different disciplines all being able to come together and have a, and have meaning. And there was a and then he also when he was there uh, gave a talk at Cooper Union in their main hall that was just. Packed. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Well, did you go to that? I did. I what did. What was it like? I that think night? It, was, it must have been crazy. I think there were people crazy. banging on the door. Yeah, it, was, get in, right? it was crazy. So, and it was particularly, you know, with his the free international university. That um, I mean, when he came to to New York, uh, there were at, uh, there was a team of his students from I think they were from the Ar Ireland branch of FIU, and they were like a little army. I mean, and he was definitely a, you know, a star figure that people just were drawn to. And um, and for whatever reason, he was always very um, professional with me, very polite, very nice, very, you know, no, no drama. Um, but there was lots of drama. <laughs> <laughs> and the one person he wanted to meet was Warhol. Mm. And they met that that winter, and then did stuff together in the past, or in the, yeah. you know after that. And uh, and he was you know was a member of the Green Party and very involved with that. And he flew over on the Concord, which of course was antithetical to everything to do with the Green Party. So he's filled <laughs> with uh, but he was he was definitely a force. Were you there that day? The, there are famous pictures from Warhol and Boising and Edgar Right, yeah. You know what? I don't remember. I, don't, I probably was, but... Were was... people critical at the, at the time of his, um, the persona, which I think is part of what... To a certain extent, I think there was some of that. That it was, um, I mean, the, the shaman, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the hero, the, you know, everything that he did, the, the persona. Um, I think there was some criticism but and I, and I had uh, people say to me how could you have endured the, the, the installation because I was you know every step of the way um, from the beginning to the I mean we had the, one of the pieces I don't remember the name it was that was made of fat and it was huge on the ground floor and the registrar who lived down the block, would actually take home parts of it to boil to get back and fix up the, <laughs> the pieces. It was crazy, absolutely crazy. But again, going you know, thinking what you're saying, one of the people, and I debated whether to name this person, but I think it's fair to, one of the people I took through the exhibition when it was closed uh, was David Rockefeller. And with the, particularly with the Chase Manhattan Bank um, collection, and we started at the top and walked down, and and the installation had drawings all along the wall going down and around the, the uh, spiral, and and all he could look at were the drawings. Mm -hmm. He could he couldn't really deal with the actual objects. And he said to me, who collects this stuff? <laughs> and it was, you know, it was so, so there's somebody with, you know, 
obviously, you know, sophisticated art historical knowledge who just couldn't connect to it. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a, for a lot of people, there was, there was that, but for a lot of people, that it really changed their, their, you know, changed their thinking about things. So is there any one artist in particular that comes to mind who you worked with? Well, you know what's interesting is I do, I think that one of the fascinating things about Boyes is the multivalent nature of his practice. Mm -hmm. So he really, he did start out drawing. Um, and I, I think draws beautifully. Yeah, and yeah. He, he made hundreds and hundreds of drawings, really based on traditional genres, on portraiture and landscape. Um, and then he evolved into the material and sculptural mm -hmm. and the performative. But over the course of his career, which which frankly wasn't that long, I mean, he yeah. dies at sixty four, so yeah. he's yeah. not he's not producing for as long as some of our some of our, our artists. But um, he he I think for so many. There were aspects. I, I can't think of anyone who embraces him in full. He's just, he oh, is so contradictory. He's complicated. There are aspects that don't work well with each other. <laughs> so there's an inconsistency there, which makes, which I think explains why critically his reception has been so um, mixed, and I would even say negative, because he doesn't, he, you know, I remember talking to a, a colleague of mine who teaches a survey in art history, and and saying, well, do you teach Joseph Boyce in the class? And he said, no, because I don't know where to put him. He no, doesn't no, fit. Just... You know, if you think about abstract expressionism mm -hmm. to minimalism to kind of conceptual art, he, he can actually, he doesn't fit in the narrative that we've constructed about post-war art. So I think, on the one hand, that's, um, that's hurt his understanding because we, he's not taught in the classroom. I think it's not unusual that you could be a practicing, I've had so many artists who say, I never even heard about it until after grad school. You know, I never really learned about the ways until I heard from a friend. Or, or um, I saw the cover of Avalanche magazine, mm -hmm. which, you know, he was on the first cover of Avalanche. Um, and, but I would say artists, What's interesting about him is that he was so generative in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think people almost like sampling and you know, if you're a DJ and you're mixing, I think he people take things right. And I view that as valid and interesting and, and complicated. I think for art for art history, it doesn't it doesn't fit into our the way we like to tell a linear tale. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that explains why he's had a, a limited and I would say negative reception, plus the combination. You know, the biggest influence on Boyce's reception was this article by Benjamin Booklet, Violet the Eye, which was a critique of the Good Man Show, mm -hmm. in which he basically compares Boyce to a fascist, and it's, it's, it's a powerful critique um, that had a huge shadow, I would say, for 40 years. And, and when you, I mean, you know, you, you talk about the American response, you know, as opposed to the European response. I find the Europeans that equally, uh, in fact, probably even, uh, I find fewer people in Europe that reference to boys mm -hmm. than even here. I mean, artists. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm curious if it's because of that whole, you know, framing of them as fascists. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good question, and I haven't looked at it, so I would. I don't want to. I don't want to opine on that, but I. I do think it's interesting how he does generate these polarizing responses mm -hmm. for 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 art historians and critics, but not for artists. I mean, I was um, in Tom Sachs' studio not too long ago, and he was making a motorcycle, which was based on the boys, um, some of the work in the Guggenheim show, where the, the emergency kits are kind of trailing behind yeah, yeah, yeah. the, uh, the, the, um, the Volkswagen bus. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, but I think that looking across these, um, these practices, you can really find a huge number of powerful, he, he definitely had a touch on the zeitgeist in a way that mm -hmm. was, that was, transforming for people. And so I'm interested to, to hear if you've talked to people who, when they experienced the Good Man Show, what, would, what did they say? What did, after walking the ramps in this dim, you know, it was very much a Gassant conspire, right? Like this whole thing was a Well, show. the very, very first piece at the top of the ramp was um, his baby bathtub. 
and I'm, I'm just going to find it very, very quickly. And it's it's got uh, gauze, and it's it's an unpleasant it's an unpleasant object. Um, I'm sorry, it's taking so long. Um, damn, I'm sorry. Well, I, I had people say. How could you? How could you work with this? How could you live with this every day? Because I was involved, obviously, in the installation. So here's the that bathtub, piece of the bathtub, mm -hmm. which is um, was his bathtub. So there's this this personal uh, quality to it, and he made this piece in 1960, and it's got you know it's got bandages and it's got um, it, it's it's wounded. Uh, very, very definitely, and I and and then it, you know goes down. You, can, you go down the ramp from there, and pe a lot of people found it very depressing and uh, uh, and upsetting, and um, and yet powerful, and couldn't you know you had a lot of people who couldn't make sense of it, um, like David Rockefeller just could not really look at the objects. Uh, and could only look at the drawings, which he could relate to. But at the same time, people who did spend time with it uh, were were transformed in 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 you know different ways. And it, uh, I think, I mean, it's funny how you don't hear about him now. I don't, I don't think you don't. I don't know. Do you? No, I don't, I don't think a, a lot, particularly yeah. in. You know, in the in the social practice mm -hmm. world, you know, because I think, you know, I mean, when I speak with my students about just boys, I mostly speak to them about, you know, him as a conceptualist mm -hmm. and who, uh, you know, frame the concept of social sculpture and not about his social sculptural works mm -hmm. because. It, you know, and and maybe that's because his life was not, you know, he, he didn't live a long life to practice it and to play it out. I mean, of course, Seven Death Notes, you know, is probably the most well-known mm -hmm. uh, uh, social sculpture piece. And I know there's a lot of other work as well, but it was never really uh, defined mm -hmm. as, you know, a definitive part of this practice that you can see and you can understand. I don't even know if that people wrote very much about his uh, uh, social practice, uh, the manifestation of social practice in his work. Has there been any, and I don't know that either, has there been since Project Row House is, is almost 30, did you say? Yeah, it was 30. Uh, has, there, has there been any critical writing? About Project Row Houses in relationship to boys? No, I mean, there, well, there's been, you know, the, you know, the graduate student, you know, mm -hmm. PhD students out there, that was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. I think someone did one with Suzanne Lacey, myself, mm -hmm. and just boys and stuff like that. But nothing, you know, nothing on a major level. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But it's, um, yeah, I think, well, I think the discourse sort of transitioned into relational aesthetics and this idea of how um, becoming more interested in how the, the viewer and or the community completes the artwork. Mm -hmm. And Boyce was such a charismatic and so central to his work, mm -hmm. right? So as a, his, I think of his teaching pieces or even things like the FIU, he was always at the center of yeah. the person. Yeah. Yeah. His, his, his body, whether it was performative or instructional or an action was always really central. And in fact, the, the works he started didn't live beyond him. So he, FIU left to maybe two years after his death, 1988, and kind of collapsed. And so I think that, um, you know, there, there has been writing about that historic work. And then I think as, as the discourse, as the social practice has evolved, um, I think that origin has gotten you know, it's, it's transitioned to other things which were a little bit different than his mm -hmm. own. Certainly, um, 7,000 Oaks was completed after his death by volunteers and community mm -hmm. members of diverse people. Um, and that's probably why maybe the best example of how it. it you want to give us a quick explanation of 7,000 Oaks? 
Sure. So it was a proposal for Documenta Castle 1981, which involved 7,000 basalt stelae, which were piled up in one location on a public square and intended to be planted together with an oak tree throughout the city of Castle. And they were, in fact, planted over five or six, maybe even longer. It extended beyond his, his passing a few years later. Um, and for boys, I mean, again, the, the oak tree was chosen specifically for its connection to German uh, myth and folklore and kind of meaning. And, and again, that was divorced from later tellings. You know, I think yeah. that there's much that hasn't been written, I think, about his um, connection to the spiritual, which is very, uh, that's very hard for us to yeah. talk about yeah. in, the, in the 21st century context. But the, the 7,000 Oaks, I think, was inspiring um, also for its relation to his work with the Green Party. So he had been very active mm -hmm. since the 70s in the Green Party, and that very much informed his interest in bringing attention to um, the deforestation of cities like Castle during World War II, an attempt. It was also it was a healing act, and there was definitely a thread of healing throughout the practice, whether rapid about his own personal mythology, however you feel about it, but it had, it had the healing element to it. We should maybe just quickly explain the story that of his being shot down during the war. Well, and you, you might know best, and maybe you asked him about it. <laughs> and, uh, the, the, the myth goes that um, he, he was in the revolver, as all young German men were, and he was rather involved, and he was shot down and the story goes, and went for a long time, I think, that he was saved by a group of Tartars who wrapped him in fat and felt and saved his life, right? Um, well, it sounds a little apocryphal just even in the telling of it. And it does, it is very clearly stated that that was, did not happen. Um, I think he was. I think, I think he was actually in a prison camp for a while. I think he was shot down and um, and was in a, like a British prison camp or something. But anyway, this this mythic story, of course, with a, I was doing something with somebody who got to go. I can't remember. I don't think it was anything to do with any anyone here, but it might have been. But that whatever it was, this person wrote back and said. Oh gee, I'm so sorry. I don't have enough fat and felt to bring that over to you. <laughs> so, so the you know that the you know those two media mm -hmm. mediums of fat and felt obviously were were central to his work. Um, but he was a he was a a, a myth maker. Mm -hmm. I mean, a storyteller, um, and people were caught up. In it, you know, yeah. amazing. And I also think that that work, you know, I mean, that was part of their existence, though, in America. Though. I mean, you know, yeah. you get this tell from the response of people in the audience when you're reading the text, like yeah. stuff out. People were like, you know, yeah, right, these are great stories, but you know, they yeah, just yeah, want, yeah. didn't want any part of it, you know. Yeah. 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 But that, yeah, that spiritual. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm interested to know, as a young artist, when you were first getting to know his work, so maybe after you read Energy Plan for the Western Man and thought, wow, there's something here, right, that's interesting for me or generative for me, how did you feel about, um, obviously as you dove deeper, you probably got some of these other pieces of, this, of his complex. So what did you feel about um, the various aspects of his practice? Yeah, a good question because I, um, you know, I took wholeheartedly social sculpture and I took it very literal. You know, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna literally do this. And um, but the rest of the work I had no meaning whatsoever. I mean, in fact, you know, I talk about, you know, I talk about that about how those first five pages of that second chapter was the most meaningful. I read the rest of it, but it was just kind of more of his world of fantasy and, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, just kind of ripping on things that didn't, didn't really mean very much for me. Uh, so prior, it didn't mean very much at all, but then the social sculpture did. But then strangely enough, though, in the last 10 years, you know, uh, you know I've been drawn to the fall aspects of it, oh, which is kind of interesting. And I think maybe it's, um, you know, it's just kind of my my approach to things, you know. I mean, I'm much more about 
the content of things. That's what usually you know, I'm gravitating toward. And then the form comes later. And so so I couldn't get voids in the beginning because it was all about the formalism. And then later I was able to get to some of the content that was okay, and then it later rolled back to the formal. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. That's fantastic. So do you feel like his his material innovations are still relevant today? Yeah, I think so. You know, I mean I think, you know, there there are lots of artists that, you know, that that draw upon that. You know, and that I think it's very you know, I, I think it, it opened up, you know, some ways of some possibilities of, of how to manifest work um, uh, in the world, and uh, just as the social sculpture did for me, uh, the formal aspect has done plenty for artists. And you can see it now, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I just saw, you know, Gaster Gates work at uh, White Chapel, and I was like, I, you know, and it's like, like you know, I, mean, I can, you can see remnants of his formal stuff throughout. And would the do you think the Astro would say that he is cognizant of voice, or do you think at this point it's more of that osmotic effect that Mel Chen talked about? It's probably the osmotic effect, I, yeah. I would think. Yeah. yeah. But he would recognize yeah. voice as a, not necessarily an influence, but a, a force, wouldn't you, don't you think? I don't know. No, maybe, maybe, you know, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I mean, because, you know, there's a very good about, about, about recognizing Project Rojas. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good about that. Yeah, but you know, but it's not, I mean, there are there are a lot of um, you know, uh, just you know, artists really kind of revealing you know where their their sources mm -hmm. are and what they're and, and you don't you don't get that a whole lot, right? right. You know, everybody feels I think everybody feels kind of threatened that they have to be pushing their, pushing the boundaries from some some unknown place as opposed to. Because I always, you know, I mean, as I started to explore, you know, the boys formally, I went straight back to Duchamp, you know, no, 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 no. so that was, you know, and, and actually, you know, in, in many ways, I kind of found, uh, you know, Duchamp formally more interesting for me than, uh, yeah. than, 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 than boys because it wasn't so much about the materiality of it. It was really still, you know, it was the material in context. You know, which was really interesting for me to show. So. Well, that's very interesting. Well, I know we have to wrap up soon. Um, any last comments, thoughts, observations from either of you? Well, I'm curious to ask, if I may, to ask Rick about the future of social sculpture. So I think I see it, I see a lineage here, which really I do think we can credit boys with opening that door. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, I think if we think he was opening a door at a time, coming out of Vietnam, coming out of um, some difficult political tensions, the AIDS crisis, the Reagan era, the trickle-down economics yeah. and the negative impact of that. I mean, there were a lot of problems at that moment that I think made so social sculpture even more important. So I'm curious where you think it might go tomorrow. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I do think that you know, the social sculpture is kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it's against the wall, you know, at this point from, from my perspective. And well, I what think, do you mean by that? I think it's just kind of hit like a, a wall, think, uh -huh. it's hit a wall, you know, that, um, in terms of where yeah. you go. And I think part of that is, part of that, from my views, can be uh, connected to how it's been shaped and framed as, you know, the quote unquote soft, Problem solving mm -hmm. art form, and um, you know, and, and while I'm very interested, I got into it because of the, the problem solving mm -hmm. aspects. But uh, as I've practiced over the years, I realized that the symbolic aspect of the work is equally and sometimes more important than the problem solving, and um, and and so I think it has to get. It has to find its way, strange enough, back into the poetics of voice. You know, I mean, where it's it's not beholden and not counted. You know, like you know, 
beings, you know, and you can't measure it in that way, you know, uh, just like, you know, all great art, you know, it's kind of hard to have this particular measuring stick because it can have so many different ways of impacting. And uh, so I think social sculpture, social practice, all of that, you know, it has to kind of work itself beyond that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think it'll take a little while to become popularized. And, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, you know, and there are many people doing it now. Right. But, you know, who are the people that are doing it that's really going to push it to that next, that next place? Mm-hmm. I don't know where that's, where, where they are and where that's going to go. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully, hopefully it will go deeper into, you know, boys' you know, initial uh, concept of it, you know, working its way into these places that we still haven't been able to reach, you know, politics, yeah, yeah. Uh, environmental, all these other yeah. places where uh, the idea of framing social sculpture would be very powerful and, and, uh, uh, and opening things up for people to do amazing stuff. We just haven't gotten there yet. Well, that's, I think, a good note to end on. Uh, thank you all very much, and uh, many thanks to uh, the Goethe Pop Up Institute mm-hmm. and to Grant and for bringing us all together for this and celebrating the 100th anniversary of Boyce's birth, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> but, well, well, you know, but the good thing about it, though, is that, you know, he's, he, you know, okay, he's 100. Yes. Can you make it to the 200 mark? You know? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the measure. Exactly, exactly. Hopefully so, he will. Hopefully he will. So, I hope so, too. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.